Nevada with a very special welcome to our friends and guests and for our returning snowbirds. It's quite good to have you all back. Um, not a whole lot has changed since last week. If you're too chilly, go ahead and close the windows. I just want to air it out before we all got here. Fresh air, you know, got to put these things. Uh, Sunday school for the adults continues at 9 every Sunday. Um, the the uh, prayer labyrinth is complete. Uh, it's over here um, in the what was the empty lot on the Spruce Street side. So uh, be sure to check that out. A lot of a lot of help and a lot of work went into that. There'll be an article in the next newsletter. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who helped out with that. Uh, if I've been doing it by myself, I might have had the entrance way done. So. Um, on our prayer concerns, uh, we've added Linda Martin, Don Stouffer, he got a new hip last week, Pastor Bill Medford, he had a slight heart attack, uh, Cora Bear, she has some tummy issues, spent the night in the hospital, she's home, she's fine. <laughs> a friend of mine, Julie Brown, who had some surgery, and Elaine Lauer, who had a heart attack last week, is at St. E's downtown, uh, working on getting her home as soon as possible, and Wilbur is home. So, uh, progress. Uh, we're also praying for the families of Pat Wild and William Bill Fry. His funeral uh, will be this coming Saturday at Woods Reddick. Uh, he was the owner of Bill Willie's over there in Washingtonville. Do we have any other announcements this morning? Let us begin our worship with meditation and with prayer. <sighs>
Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We are the treasured people of the Lord. A people holy to the Lord our God. We must keep the words of the Lord in our hearts and teach them to our children. We need to talk about God's word at home and when we are away, when we lie down and when we rise. We do not live by bread alone. But by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Passion, you have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour our love into our hearts, that overflowing with joy, we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> that was an old thing. Uh, there are people that have a nickname, okay? And everybody calls them that nickname, and nobody actually knows what their real name is. That happens a lot of them. It, it does. <laughs> so um, we, what might have happened is whoever was writing down the story either wrote down his nickname or just heard it wrong, okay? Because his, Barnabas' name is in the other Gospels, but it's not the one we read today. But the most important thing is these 12 people went out and told people about Jesus and how much God loved them. And Jesus says that to us too. He wants us to go out and tell people how much God loves them because it's real important. All right? You think you can do that? Yeah? With your unicorn hat on? Thanks for coming up. Everybody take one. You can go sit back down. 
without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Creator, from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. We talked last week about the importance of the people of God being given the Great Commission, how we need to go out and proclaim the gospel. Now we think that on, and we think about that on the day that we're here, worshiping together, and we may even consider ideas of how we can go about fulfilling our part of the Great Commission. Then Monday comes. Day-to-day -day life takes over. And we go to work, we go to various sporting events, we mow the lawn, we spend time with family, we run errands. All of us have seemingly endless to-do lists. Then we gather again <coughs> for an hour on Sunday, and we praise and we worship. If that's all it is, we're in trouble. If the only time we are being the church and doing the business of the people of God is during worship, then we are not accomplishing the mission for which the church was created. So what is the mission of the church? Many committees over many, many years have spent long hours trying to define a conclusive answer to this question. What is our mission? How are we to carry it out? How much will it cost? How long will it take? Who should be sent? There are all sorts of considerations when pondering the question, what is it that we as a church, the people of God, are supposed to do to accomplish God's plan for the church? Of the four Gospels, only Matthew talks about the church. And he calls the gathering of those who are believers in Christ the ecclesia, or the church. The other three Gospels never mention this designation. It is unique to Matthew. It is believed that the Gospel of Matthew was written between the late 50s and 70s AD, the time when the infant church had grown to a point that it needed some guidelines. The Gospel of Matthew was written down as a guide for what Jesus had called his followers to do. Matthew's author emphasized Jesus' teaching and preaching. It describes how believers are to be in the world. It also details how the world should and will treat the followers of Christ. Jesus is the life example we are to follow as we go about doing the church's mission, our mission in the world. Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. The first thing Jesus did was teach and preach. The message of God's love had to come first. People had to hear the good news before they could act on it. In many of the healing stories, after the act of healing had been completed, Jesus would say to the one who had come for help, your faith has made you well. Jesus' healing came to those who had faith. But before they could have faith, they had to hear the good news. Spreading the message, speaking the word, that has to come first. Then the response of faith of the people opened the way for the healing. Next, Jesus looked out upon the multitudes and felt compassion, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd in first century Israel pretty much were lost. With no protection, thieves could steal them, wild animals would attack and kill them. There was nothing to keep, the, nothing a sheep could do to protect themselves. The multitudes who came to Jesus were lost. They came looking for guidance, for protection, for 
healing, for hope. And they were the lucky ones because they had managed to find their way to Jesus. But there were so many out there who had not. And you can sense Jesus' frustration when he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Jesus, as a human being, could only be in one place at one time. And we all know the frustration that that can cause. To reach the lost sheep, Jesus had to delegate some responsibility. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus called his twelve apostles, gave them the authority to drive out demons and heal diseases, and gave them instructions as to where they were to go and what they were to do. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of God has come near. The mission of the disciples was the same as Jesus' mission. First, go looking for the lost sheep of Israel, preach the good news to them, heal the sick, cast out demons. Jesus searched out the lost ones. The disciples were to go looking for the lost ones. Jesus would teach and preach. The disciples were to teach and preach. Jesus would heal. The disciples were to heal. The mission of the disciples, the mission of the church, is to do what Jesus did. The mission of the church is to search out and have compassion for those who are lost, to reach out to those who are in need, and to proclaim the message of the kingdom of God. Whether or not the message is received by those who hear it, that's not the point. It's not up to the workers to bring people to faith. It is the task of God's messengers to proclaim the good news. If the people accept it, well and good. If they don't, shake the dust off your feet and move on. The message, the mission, message, I'll get it. The message that the disciples were to preach was, the kingdom of God has come near. Now what exactly does that mean? Scholars who study Matthew believe that the message, the kingdom of heaven has come near, has nothing to do with time. What it does have to do with is how the mission of the church is being carried out. Jesus is saying that we can experience the hope and the promise of the kingdom of heaven right now, even as we anticipate Christ's return on the last day. Repentance, forgiveness, healing are all possible for us now because the kingdom of heaven has come here. God's kingdom is invading the world now, and we, as the children of God, are part of it. The will of God is being done in the world. What God wants to have happen is happening, and the church is the agent through which this is being done. The last day, the day of Christ's return, will be the ultimate consummation of God's kingdom. If the kingdom or heaven were not here, repentance and obedience to God would not be possible. But the kingdom of God is here now. Jesus died for our sins so we could be forgiven. We accept God's gift of forgiveness to us through our faith. When we believe that our sins are forgiven, our lives change. And not because of any effort that we make to change ourselves for the better when we come to know God, though we should always try to live Christ-like lives. If it were only up to us and our human efforts, change in our lives wouldn't happen. However, God's power in our lives is transforming. God's holiness is more powerful than any evil. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives that transforms us and helps us to grow into the people God needs for us to be. And it may not seem like God is in control of this world. I mean, especially right now when so many awful things are happening. But good things are happening in our world, too. They just don't get any press. God's people are in the world doing God's work, proclaiming the kingdom of God, and God's people will prevail. Later in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. The power of evil cannot overcome the holy power of the church of God. Whenever we do God's will in the world, we will win. We may get hurt along the way, but God never promises that preaching the gospel will be safe or easy. In fact, it's just the opposite. Jesus warns his messengers, I am sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. Jesus warns of being handed over to councils, flogged in synagogues, thrown in prison, dragged before governors and kings. Not a very pleasant outlook for those who only want to share the message of salvation. 
However, in spite of these dangers, God does promise victory. No matter what happens, when we answer God's call to proclaim the good news, when we do as Jesus did, we are victorious. God's kingdom will prevail. And we, God's faithful people, God's church, will spend eternity with God. So what is the mission of the church? To search out the lost sheep of the world, to proclaim the gospel so everyone can hear, and to use our God-given gifts to comfort the sad, feed the hungry, and heal the hurting. This is what God has commanded his people to do. <clears throat> and God will be with us as we carry out that mission. Amen. Okay, it's another camp song.
Forgive us all our sin through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Amen. My sisters and brothers, rejoice. Let us mend our ways, encourage one another, agree with one another, and live in peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Peace, everyone. That's peace. Richard, if you bring up the offering. We sing the offertory verse. against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now as you go your way, may our loving God be with you, ahead of you to show you the way, above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, and within you to give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is, I the Lord of Sea and Sky, or Here I Am. Thanks be to God.